Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. When one's guilt is exposed, soon thereafter comes judgment. And it is wise for us to be quick to acknowledge our sin. And not just acknowledge our sin, but to be quick to seek mercy, forgiveness, and the grace of God. All of these things manifest a true repentance. And repentance needs to be founded in remorse and regret. Unfortunately, many times people, they do something wrong. Their wrongness, their sin, this act is exposed. And they have no remorse. They have no regret. And it is only after their guilt has been pronounced and still. They have no remorse. But when it comes time for judgment, that punishment to be placed upon them, then sometimes they have a very different perspective when they are looking at that judgment being placed immediately upon them. Well, in many ways, this describes Moab. We began last week in chapter 15, a passage known as the burden of Moab. And we see that Isaiah the prophet, he is giving visions. He is revealing truth concerning what he has seen. And he has seen God's judgment that will be placed upon Moab. Now, in this 16th chapter, the chapter we're going to deal with today, we see a couple interesting things. First of all, this judgment that God will place upon Moab will be so severe, even Isaiah. When God reveals it to him, even Isaiah is moved by that. Isaiah is grieved over it inwardly, in other words. When he sees this severe punishment that God will place upon Moab, it makes him physically sick. And it shows the strong emotional feelings that he had in regard to being a witness of the judgment and the wrath of God. Now, many people will place this chapter in regard to Assyria coming and on their way to Judah, they brought about this destruction of Moab. That's one interpretation. But when we look at some of the scriptural indicators within the sixth chapter, we're going to see that it has a lot to do with the last days. And over and over, I want to lay this foundation for you, and that is this. Even when prophecy speaks about a, a present day, and when I say present day, I'm speaking of the ones who heard this prophecy in their time or shortly thereafter. So from our perspective, way in the past, more than 2,500 years ago, and even though that this scripture, some of it could be applied to that, I would suggest, and I would do so strongly, that the best way to understand this is in the last days, when God's judgment, even his wrath, is poured out upon the enemies of Israel, those people that inhabit these geographical locations, places like Moab, east of Israel, in what's modern-day Jordan today. 
Well, with that said, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Isaiah and chapter 16 again. This burden, these harsh words for Moab, they continue. Verse 16 or chapter 16 and verse 1. He says, send forth, and the word here is the word har. This word speaks about sheep, perhaps a fattened or prepared sheep, one that is ready to be sacrificed. In other commentators, you'll find that it speaks not just of one, but a flock of sheep that is offered up. And the important thing here is how verse 1 is, is utilized within this chapter. It is a call to, and if we keep reading, we see the phrase, Moshel Eretz. Moshel, in modern Hebrew, it can be used for a ruler as a governor. Or it can be used in ancient Hebrew for one like Joseph in Egypt that was in power, that had authority. It's also a term that is used, for example, in Micah chapter 5, relating to the rule, the administration of Messiah. But here it's speaking about the ruler of the land, and what land? The land of Moab. So he's being instructed to lead his nation. And that's why it says, send forth. It's in the plural, but the primary subject is singular, the leader of Moab. So he's being commanded through the prophet Isaiah to offer up, to send tribute to, and notice what it says if we keep reading all the verse. Send forth sheep, O ruler of the land, from Selah, and Selah was a location in Moab. And we're going to speak of many different geographical locations that are related to Moab, their chief cities, their most famous places. So he says, from Selah, through the wilderness, and then it says, unto the mountain of the daughter of Zion. And this is, of course, we're speaking about Jerusalem. I would suggest to you that this term, Batzion, is a prophetic term that speaks about Jerusalem, that location, but at the time of the end. In other words, the fact that it says not Jerusalem, but Zion, should help us understand a last day context for this passage of Scripture. So we see that Moab, who was an enemy of Israel. Now, there's a very famous passage dealing with Moab, and I'm speaking about Deuteronomy chapter 23 and verse 4. This has to do with the children of Israel wanting to pass through Moab. And Moab should have, and they were convicted by this truth, that God was with the children of Israel, that God was leading them. God had brought defeat upon the enemies of Israel, certainly in Egypt and other places, as they traveled towards the inheritance, that promised land. And it would have been wise, it would have been proper for Moab to respond in obedience to the revelation of God, that his hand is upon Israel, this people, and he's leading them to the land of Canaan to establish the kingdom of Israel. But Moab, he did not submit to this. He did not want to participate with this. But what did he do? He stood in opposition to the will of God. And what we see here in this passage of Scripture is that he is being commanded, the people, and I'll show you why I believe it's a last day context in a few minutes. They are being given opportunity to repent, to turn, and to embrace the kingdom of God. Not the kingdom of Israel, 
that Joshua led the people to, to inhabit some 3,500 years ago. But we're talking about not the establishment of the ancient kingdom of Israel, but the kingdom of God, which will have its establishment in the land of Israel in the last days. But unfortunately, once more, Moab, for the most part, is going to reject this. They are not going to submit to this instruction to worship the God of Israel and to offer him up a choice sacrifice. Look now to verse 2. But because, and the implication is because they will not, or the implications if they don't, and we know they will not, what will they be like? Well, look at verse 2. And it will come about as a foul, and this is simply the ancient Hebrew word, oaf for, for a bird. So I'll use the word foul, and the next word is the word no dead, which is a, a bird that is migrating, moving, but, but with confusion. They are wandering rather than being on a, a sure path. So because Moab does not submit to the instruction of God, because they will not recognize the God of Israel, they are going to be like a confused bird that is trying to get low to a location, but he does not have the knowledge of how to do that because of this confusion. And then we have a, another example. We have the word nest and a bird that is sent forth from the nest. And this would be like one who is rejected. It's not speaking about a young bird that uh, the parents set off to, to grow, to mature, to begin its own life. No, we're talking here about a, a bird that is rejected by the parents and cast out of the nest. And this is going to be what the daughter of Moab will be like. This is her eternal destiny because of her persistent faithlessness. And then it says that she is going to be doing this where will we have the word for a passageway. A passageway of our known. Now this has to do with the southern border of Moab and the river that was there and what we would call the fords that, that are around it. They are fleeing. They're getting out of Moab because of this judgment. But they're not going, the majority are not going to the right location. They're not interested in finding security with the God of Israel and the people of Israel. No, they're going in a different direction. They're heading southward, and the implication is perhaps to Egypt rather to Israel. Look now to verse, verse 3. In verse 3, there is a call to the Jewish people in these last days to be different, not to return evil for evil, but to receive the sojourner. Now, over and over in the Torah, we find that. We are told that we should not be haughty and prideful, but because God has been gracious to us, we should afford grace to others. Because we were sojourners that we should receive and be kind to the sojourners. Because we were exiles, we should be kind to exiles. So in verse 3, he's speaking specifically to the covenant people of God. And he says, bring counsel. Now, this can be an idea of having reflection based upon the instruction of God and then demonstrating that truth, demonstrating that wisdom that God has given. So it has to do with putting counsel into action, bring God's counsel into a situation. And notice what it says, asu 
Klila. Now, asu means to do. I mean, I believe that many translators will, will use the term for execute, but it's simply the word for do this. So, make what? And it's word palila, which is the word for a, a penal code, which means to make justice. So, Israel is being called in the midst of this to remember the counsel of God. His instructions reflect, meditate upon his word so that you can execute justice. And he says, and, and I will place as the night your shadow. Your shadow when? In the midst of the noontime. Now, what is God saying here? And let me simply say, that, that this chapter, to rightly understand it, it took a lot of time, a lot of examination of the text, a lot of prayer. And what I found the least helpful was looking at commentators. And the reason for that is this. Some of the most popular commentators that you'll find online are those that have a very incorrect methodology for for publishing their commentator commentary what they do is this they they search many other commentators and they take some of the most popular some of the most well-known some of the views but here's the problem they oftentimes do this without thinking about the context meaning this they will take the the prevalent views for one verse and then they'll go and take some of the other prominent views that are found for the next verse but oftentimes there's not a continuity they they are taking each verse almost independently from the one that precedes it or the one that follows it and that leads to confusion and that's why when you rely upon commentaries alone Oftentimes, the, the, the message of the text does not become clear. So in verse 3, we see something. God is saying to the Jewish people that you utilize counsel, my instruction, that you execute justice, and you make the shadow, your shadow at night, in the midst of the day. Now, what's he speaking about here? Well, a shadow hides. It covers. It, it can shelter someone. The darkness covers up. And that's why many times criminals, they will behave at nighttime because they cannot be seen. And what this is speaking about, if you look at the context and keep reading, it says, Satri Nidachim. Nidachim has to do with exiles. And this next word is a word for to hide. So it's my hiding place. We might think of it as a refuge. So what God is telling the people is this. Remember my instructions. My instructions to you. You be remindful of the sojourner. You be the one that's kind to the foreigner in your midst. For you too were sojourners. You too were exiles. So He's admonishing Israel for those who escape, for those of Moab who do come to the land of Israel to find shelter with the people of God, you be a shelter for them. You cover them up. And this is in quite contrast to what we see during the Babylonian captivity and the Edomites, the children of Esau. If you look, for example, in Psalm 137, which speaks about the Babylonian captivity, it speaks about Edom, and also in the book of Obadiah. And what you'll find here is that Edom, the, the, those of Judah who had escaped from Babylon, what did Edom do? They saw them instead of providing shelter, assisting them, they placed upon them they cut down they punish 
those refugees, those exiles. And God is warning Israel not to be like this. Now, of course, what I'm speaking about with Babylon and the Edomites and the Babylonian captivity, that's 2,500 years ago. But this is counsel for Israel in the last days. He says, you be a hiding place for them. Because of the Shodet, that is the one that wants to plunder them. And he says, because Ephes, Ephes is, is nothing, is the, the oppressor. And it could mean this. If you don't provide shelter, that oppressor is going to cause none, zero, Ephes to survive. And also the destruction the destruction is going to come to, to an end, meaning it's going to end everything, this destruction. And then it says, the, the one who tramples, and then it speaks of it in the plural, it says they are going to come to an end as well. There's two different words here for end, the word kala and the word uh, tam. It says the one who treads, meaning to trample down, trample down, they are going to bring an end from the earth. Now, what God is revealing is that this judgment is going to be to be vast. It is going to be complete. And the only place, the only, and hear this, the only place for the exiles of Moab to flee is to Israel. But here's the key. And if we miss this, we've misunderstood what's going to be said to us in the future, in the second part of this passage. The time to flee, the time to leave, the time to respond is now. Not in the midst of this judgment. If you wait until the end, you're not going to survive. Because the oppressor, he is going to oppress everyone. There's going to be none, zero survivors. If you wait until the end, the one who tramples down, he is going to bring about a total destruction. So this is what the scripture is saying to Moab. And the revelation is here through the prophet Isaiah. Look now to verse 5. Now, verse 5, I would highlight it because for me, verse 5 is the key verse that tells us this prophecy does indeed have significant implications for the last day. It speaks about a transition, a transition away from this world into the kingdom, the kingdom that Messiah Yeshua, that he will rule over for that millennial kingdom. And the reason why I say that, if you just look at what verse 5 says, I think it's rather clear. Let's take these words very carefully. The word huchan is a word for to be established. What is going to be established? Well, the third word that I read, kise, is throne. So a throne is going to be established. And it's going to be established by chesed, with grace. Some Bibles will say mercy, but it's a better word that speaks about God's loving kindness that comes through a covenant offering. And that's very, very important that we see that. Grace is God's kindness, His steadfast love that's available, but only through a covenant. It's by means of a covenant. And this scripture is saying that and the vav in front of it tells us we're speaking about the future. So the throne with grace will be established and he will sit upon it in truth. Who's the one that's going to sit upon it? Notice it says, Be'ohel David. In the tent of David. And obviously, at this time, David is no more. 
We're speaking about minimally, minimally 200 years after David when this prophecy was given. So when David, that term David is used after the death of King David, David the son of Yeshai, we know something. It is a, a hermeneutical aid that assists us in realizing that we're speaking about Messiah. And not just about Messiah, about, but rather about the Messianic age, the kingdom age. So this throne that's going to be established with grace is the throne of Messiah in the millennial kingdom. And it says that, that he will be Shofet. He's a judge. And he is going to demand justice. And quickly he will bring about righteousness. So verse 5 is a key verse in helping us understand the proper context, the primary context for verse 16. And again, I would simply suggest to you that so much of Isaiah speaks about things. It may use older events, but it wants us to understand the end time significance of them and makes the end times the primary message of the text. Verse 6. We have heard, and this is speaking about the leader of Moab. We have heard, and the word Gaon has to do with one who is very, very intelligent. But oftentimes, we're speaking about a worldly intelligent. And that worldly intelligence can lead to pride. And grammatically, there is a close relationship between the word for intelligence and the word for pride. So he says here, we have heard about this intelligent one of Moab. How he has, gameod, meaning great pride. And not only great pride, it says, pride and intelligence. But notice what it says, and his wrath. Now, what the scripture is saying is this. It is because of his pride, his intelligence, which is not utilized in the truth of God, but the ways of the world, that he is going to become a recipient of the wrath of God. And it says, not thus, meaning it will not be thus. What won't? His lie. So the king of Moab, he has intelligence. And what does he do? He uses his intelligence for a selfish purpose, pridefulness. And he lies. He believes he can deceive others. And he may deceive many, but he's not going to deceive God. And therefore, it's for this reason that God's judgment will indeed come upon his nation. And that's why Isaiah's prophecy is to get out. Don't remain in Moab. Don't remain connected to the citizens, the people of Moab. Be like Ruth. Ruth, she says, your people are my people. Your God is my God. And God honored her, this Moabite woman. And we're going to see that, that God's intent is to receive all those in the last day from Moab. But now's the time, not in the midst of this judgment, but now the time is to flee, to leave and embrace the God of Israel. Verse, verse 7. Therefore, because of this judgment that's coming, he says, therefore Moab will howl. And this is like a lamentation. This is an expression of grief. Therefore, Moab will howl for Moab. Meaning that when one looks of Moab upon their neighbor, when they see what's being done to their nation, not only will they be suffering in and of themselves, but they will also be suffering and grieved and lamenting what has happened to 
their people and their nation. It says all of her is going to how? Unto the very foundations of Kir Hareset. Kir Hareset was, most scholars believe, the capital of Moab. And many will tell you that it is or was a glorious city. All the splendor and the glory that Moab could muster up was placed into this city. And when you look, for example, at 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 25 specifically, but when you look in that chapter, a king of Israel named Yehoram, he destroys, he places judgment on Moab. But he did not destroy the stones of, of this city. This city's foundation, notice what he says here. It says, this city's foundation in those days under King Yehoram was not ruined. Their stones remain in place even though the people were cut down. But this will not be the case in this prophecy. In this prophecy, it says that all of it is going to howl even unto the foundations of, not like previously when it was spared, this time even the foundations of Kir Hareset, and they will mourn. They will have great grief. It's a total annihilation. And it says, surely, and it's speaking about this place, this capital of Moab, it says, surely, they, meaning all the inhabitants, all the residents, surely they will be, and the word here is the word, nekavim, excuse me, nekaim, and it speaks about, it's a synonym for the word lishbor, to break, but in this case, it's in the passive, so it says, they will be broken. And it speaks simply about this complete and total annihilation. Look now to, to verse 8. And speaking about the judgment, not only is the capital, Kir Hareset, going to be mentioned and destroyed, but other of its glorious cities. I'm speaking about an earthly glory. Look at verse 8. For the fields of Heshbon, they will be miserable. And the vine of Sivma, and it's Sivma, also they will be. For the masters of the nations, they will strike, and they will strike the choice, choice vines, and they will arrive even to Yazer. So these chief places of Moab, they are re receiving judgment, and the judgment is on all, even the very best. And this is a play on words. It's a synonym. We have the word Geffen and also the word Saruk. Saruk has to do with a vine. Geffen is vine, but, but this word Saruk is even a, a better vine, the chief, the very best. So they are going to be struck even to Yazer, another important city, and they will wander in the wilderness. And her shoots, and this has to do with the future, their shoots, their, their other branches are going to be abandoned. This word, ditush, uh, has to do with just simply left alone to decay. No one cares for it. No one pays attention. No one sees it. No one goes there. It's, it's totally abandoned. And it says, and they will even pass to the, the sea. Meaning these branches, in order to find help and assistance, they will even go so far as the sea. But the implication is that's not going to be a source of, of rejuvenation. If a vine is looking for rejuvenation, needs pure water. So even though it keeps searching and finds nothing and even makes it to the sea, there's not going to be any positive result from it. 
verse 9. Verse 9 speaks about the prophet Isaiah. He is being given this vision which he's sharing to us. And, and notice how he responds to it. Verse 9. Therefore I will cry with the weeping of Yazer and the vine of Sivma, and I will drench you with my tears, Cheshbon and Al Ale. All of these places, Cheshbon, Yazer, also El Ale, all of these are chief cities that Isaiah is seeing God's judgment destroy. And it's so, so strong and complete. The destruction is absolute. And he sees the suffering of the individuals. And he's grieved, he's weeping bitterly because of it. For concerning, and notice this next word, it's a word, kites. Kites means summer. But this has a second person possessive pronoun, your summer. And it doesn't mean your summer, but it's speaking about summer fruit. Now, if you are a good student of prophecy, you have encountered this before, for example, in Amos. And, and summer fruit, the harvest comes and the fruit, some of it, some of it's very good. You take it immediately. But some have not ripened. So you wait. You don't destroy it immediately. You don't ignore it. You have hope. There is a, a hopeful expectation, a desire that, that later on in the summer that this fruit will mature and be, be useful, be, be harvestable. That's the hope. But what God's saying here, even though he waited until the very end, the end of the harvest, what do we know? Well, he says, even though that I've waited until the end of the harvest, the Hadad. Now, Hadad is used in Hebrew today. If you were to ask me how one would translate this word Hadad, it's hooray, or you might say bravo. And it has to do with the joy of the harvest. How, if you wait and endure with expectation, that when that, that fruit does in fact ripen, the end of the harvest comes and it's plentiful. Nothing is waste. You cheer. You celebrate. But what it says here for Moab, that that hooray is going to fall down. That hope is going to evaporate. There's nothing good that's going to come from delaying this judgment. And that's why, look at verse 10. And the gladness will be gathered up and the joy from Carmel. Carmel is a, a choice, the best piece of land. And also in the vineyards, there will not be a shout, and this is a shout of joy, nor will there be singing among the, the wineries. So when people see the wine and the winery full of wine, there's rejoicing. He's saying there's going to be none of this because the one who treads, and this is the wine presses, the one who wait, makes the wine, who steps upon the grapes, they're not going to be. And once more, he says that same word, Hadad. Hadad, he says, and notice his word, Hishbati. This is a word for brain to an end. It's the same word for Shabbat. Shabbat is a ceasing. It's a stopping. And what he's saying is, for Moab, there's no longer any harvest. There's nothing good that's going to come from it. Everything having to do with Moab is going to come to an eternal end by means of God's judgment. Verse 11. Now, once again, the prophet, he sees this vision, he hears these words, and he's grieved. Now, why? Well, the answer is obvious. And that is Israel was supposed to be a blessing 
And the fact that nations are going to be destroyed. Israel. Israel was not obedient. Israel didn't have the effect that light to the nations. And therefore, the prophet is grieving. He says, therefore, my, and this has to do with his intestines, and it has to do with that inner part of your stomach. This word intestine or bowels is used poetically. It has to do with that feeling in the pit of your stomach when you're, you're grieved for something or that, that mercy and compassion comes up. So he has compassion for these people, but it's too late. He says, therefore, my, my bowels are for Moab as a, a, a violin hums. It's talking about here uh, a dirge being played. And my innermost is for Kir Haris. So he's saying how sad it is. He's grieved. Now he's not disagreeing with God. He acknowledges God and we saw this. God demands justice and righteousness. And that leads to his consuming wrath. But, but the, the destruction, the soul's loss, that's sad. And this is what Isaiah is, is manifesting, verse 12. And it will come about that it will appear, it will be shown that Moab is wary. And they become wary, meaning they did not find any strength, any power, any ability to, to respond differently so that this judgment would not consume them. And why didn't they find any power? Why were they, they weary and weak? It says here, because they went to where? They went to the high place. It speaks of idolatry. They would not turn away. Now, if you're a good student of the book of Revelation, when God is pouring his judgment upon the nations, it says they would not repent. And one of the things they would not repent from is their idolatry. And this is what we're seeing here. Rather, they came to his sanctuary to pray, but they were not able. Now, people interpret this last part differently. But let me simply say that they are wanting to come to his sanctuary. Perhaps this is the sanctuary in Jerusalem. His sanctuary, God's sanctuary. But it's too late. There's no more time left. The time was in verse 1. Remember verse 1? Where he says, hey, Mr. Ruler, you who think you're wise and intelligent, now's the time to worship the God of Israel, to send him a choice offering and lead your nation to do so. Now, what we find here is not true repentance. What we find here is simply as the illustration I gave earlier, someone who is defiant in their rebelliousness, their unwillingness to be remorseful, they show no regret whatsoever, but when they're going to the electric chair, when they're going to the gallows to be hung, when they're going to that final location to experience the outcome of their unrighteousness, then they begin to cry. They say how sorry they are. They plead for forgiveness. I didn't mean it. Well, this is too late. This is what God is saying to them. They will not be able. They are not going to prevail in this attempt to turn at the last minute in the midst of God's wrath to, to him. Verse 13. This is the word which the Lord has spoken to Moab may ask since now the implication is this is not new revelation now again the context in my opinion is the last days and he's saying god has offered repentance he has offered an invitation to join his people and i'm fully aware 
of what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 23 and verse 4, that a Moabite will not enter into the congregation of Israel. Well, there's a couple different interpretations of that. You know, the standard one that Judaism gives is a, a Moabite, but it's in the masculine, and that's why Ruth was received. But, but I see it differently. I see that he's saying a Moabite, if you hold on to this evil identity, this culture, if you want to continue to be a Moabite, you're lost, just like Oprah who was the, the sister-in-law of, of Ruth. Ruth, she turned and she says, your people are my people. She stopped being in her own mind thought of as a Moabite. She left. That was an end, a termination to her identity as a Moabite among herself. But but she identified with the people of Israel. And the reason why that she's always called a Moabite in the book of Ruth is because it tells us, it's an encouragement, that Ruth the Moabite joined. She was received. But these people are not. So it says, look again at, at verse 13. This is the word which the Lord spoke to Moab since for a long period of time. But now, last verse, verse 14. But now the Lord has spoken, saying, in three years. Now, notice this. Three is the number of manifesting something. In three years as the years of a hired hand, a sahir. Now, this is important because what he's saying here is this. You have to remember culture can play an important role. Oftentimes, an a individual would hire himself out to someone for three years. And at the end of those three years, he would go forth, but he would go forth empty-handed. A hireling was simply supplied, sustained, but there was no profit. And what it's saying here is this, that there's going to be no profit when this judgment is revealed. There's going to be nothing that comes from such a mindset of putting yourself under the Moabite philosophy, the Moabite idolatry, the Moabite identity. Nothing's going to be gained. The outcome of that is nothing. Finally, it says, and the glory of Moab, and this is this earthly fading glory, will be weakened. And it's the word for, for being made light, and the implication here is the glory of Moab, and how I would translate it, will be insignificant. And it's a warning to us. What we can glean from this from an application standpoint is this. When we have the wrong identity, what does that mean? When we are not identified as a servant of the living God, as a disciple of Messiah Yeshua, that is Jesus of Nazareth. When we don't have that identity, what's going to happen? Everything is going to be insignificant in our life. Think of it this way. Messiah taught, what does it matter if you gain the whole world, but you forsake your soul? In the end, all that you have acquired is going to be insignificant when God's judgment comes, and that's what it says. That glory that belonged to Moab, these glorious cities that we make mention of, all of them are going to be made insignificant. It says, among all of Hamon Haraf. Now, this is redundant. The word Hamon means many or great in abundance. And the word Rav means the same thing. So when it says here, Hey Hamon Harav, it speaks about her great abundance. The, the, the wealth, the, the wealth that she multiplied and achieved, all of that 
became nothing, insignificant. And the remnant, and praise God, there will be a remnant. But the remnant, me'at mizar. Me'at means little, mizar means small. So in the same way that we have he hamon haraf, very great in abundance, we have the exact opposite. Very small and insignificant and little. There will be no, and some Bibles say feeble, but it's not the word feeble. It's the word mighty, but there is a, a negation before it. So it says, she will not be might, mighty. She will have no might. And the implication of that, feeble. And that idea is there's nothing of stability. There's nothing that endures. There's nothing that perseveres. Moab is going to be totally destroyed. And the message, the takeaway for, for us is that we don't want to have the wrong identity. We don't want to be among the wrong people. We want to leave those things that are in conflict and contrast to the things of this world and embrace the instructions of God and unite with the people of God in the land of God doing the will of God. That brings about not judgment in a consuming sense but it brings about the eternal blessings of god well i'll close with that until next week shalom from israel well we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org again to find out more about us please visit our website loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.